Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Anne. Um, and uh, first off, great lunch, great organization. Thanks, Steve and Foodsquick, too, for a good conference. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the Android testing support library. Um, I used to work on a very small team, and uh, we were three developers. We were in charge of uh, quite a large app, a retail app, so it had a bunch of features. And uh, we had no, no QA support. Like We had some shared QA people that we could use, but only for big releases and really rarely. So um, it was very important for us to kind of test our apps. So uh, automatically test our apps, not uh, just uh, poke everything on the screen manually. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's why uh, I was really excited when this thing came out, the testing support library. So about this talk, um, it's going to be like a presentation of what it is, what component it got, and uh, what can we do with some of those components to, to test our apps better. So, um, so let, let, let's begin. So um, that's me. So I used to be, I must admit, I used to be an Android developer. I'm not anymore. <laughs> Nowadays, I mostly do libraries cross-platform, but uh, I used to do like Android for seven-ish years. So uh, I've done, I've been around the block a few times. Mm, yeah. So I currently do libraries at a company called Pusher. Uh, we are a developer tools company. So we make tools that make developers' lives easier. So you might have seen uh, this little thing that I uh, snuck into your uh, swag bags. So it's an it's invitation to check out our upcoming chat API. It's for iOS, which just means that if you're Android developers, you can still sign up, but uh, we're just going to use the iOS people as uh, test bunnies, essentially, so or lab rats, however you want to call it. Um, yeah, we are building cool stuff. If you want to push our t-shirt, just tweet us at pusher, and we'll send you one wherever you are. Uh, we're cool like that. And if you're keen to work in London on libraries and developer tools, let me know. Let's chat about it. Um, yeah. So, without further ado, testing and support library. What's in a name? So, it obviously contains two parts, and uh, the testing part on Android is uh, like there is, it's, it's a term that encompasses so many things. For instance, you can run tests, uh, you, can, you can do different tests that run on uh, different, either a JVM on your machine or where they execute on your uh, devices or emulators. So, that's one differentiator. The other one is scope. You can have unit tests that test individual units of work. Uh, they tend to execute really fast. Uh, you can run hundreds of them in, in a scope of one second. And uh, making bigger and bigger tests, integration tests, and in the end also functional and end-to-end -end tests that kind of, they, they simulate what a user would do in, in their journey. So, and uh, lastly, we have different frameworks to, we can use. So we're going to be talking about instrumentation mostly, but because uh, that's the built-in framework for testing Android apps. Um, but there's also other ones around. So RoboElectric, for instance, is uh, a framework that kind of allows you to write really fast unit tests that execute on the JVM and uh, they run really quickly, but they kind of they, they, they make the shadow implementation of Android SDK, so uh, it's not exactly uh, testing on the, on the real thing. So we're going to be looking at the things, I mean, the testing support library is focusing on the things that is, are bold, so testing on device for functional and end-to-end -end testing and uses instrumentation framework. What about the support part of the name? So, uh, Android releases are uh, few and far between, roughly once a year, uh, a big release would come out. Uh, we're currently anticipating Android version O, or Oreo. Um, I'm just uh, anticipating that. I'm, I'm, I don't actually know whether it's going to be called Oreo. Uh, anyway, new releases come with new APIs, 
um, a big, big milestones we had were Android 4 came with fragments and uh, hollow design pattern and uh, Android 5 came with uh, the material design theme and came up came with also kind of a new libraries that we could use like recycler views, card views, things like that. And uh, obviously the update curve is really, adoption curve is really slow. So um, what happens, Google people started to build libraries, support libraries that would bring backported functionality to, uh, to, the, to the developers so that if something hasn't been supported on your platform natively, for instance, the material design, so you could use the support library to bring those features to, uh, to for Android 4 devices and so on. So basically, in, in, in all honesty, the support libraries are, uh, in Chris Bain's own words, they're a mountain of hacks because they just kind of have all these, uh, they have to cover all these weird edge cases to make our apps really uh, run well and on a as wide kind of spectrum of devices as possible. So putting one and two together, we get a testing support library. Um, it's, it was announced, I think, two and a half years ago, released two years ago, so in 2015 it was released. And uh, it's really made testing on Android a lot, lot nicer. If you remember how it used to be, um, we used to, uh, we used to have to use the JUnit 3 uh, library for testing. So uh, it was all inheritance based. You have to use classes like Android Inst Activity Instrumentation Test Case 2. Um, you had to override a bunch of things. So you have to override setup and teardown methods to kind of have some scripts run before and after your tests. And uh, you have to prefix all the methods with test. So luckily, you don't have to do that anymore. Because now, uh, we're almost current now because JUnit 5 has already been released, but we can't use that yet. Um, nowadays, we can use JUnit 4, uh, which makes the API a lot nicer. So for, for, for starters, you don't have to prefix your classes with test. So you can just use the annotation based, annotation -based kind of uh, utilities for that. So you just do test and test name. Um, again, life cycle, uh, testing life cycle utilities uh, before, after, that's all there. It also an announced uh, uh, the testing rules. So you could use uh, a rule to spin up an activity instead of kind of extending this particular class. All really nice, but it's, it's, it's by far not everything that's available in the testing support library. Um, roughly, uh, arguably the biggest part of it would be Espresso, and uh, that's the functional testing library that allows us to kind of allows the computer to poke on the screen screen for us. So it's it's a bit smarter than just that. So we're gonna get to that in a second. There is also the UI automator for a different type of uh, screen poking, and uh, as I mentioned, test uh, rules, and also the runner that allows us to run everything. Um, when something gets released, they used to like not update documentation really often. So uh, I found it a really good way to kind of just dig through the dig through the Maven repository of, of the Android SDK to see what's been changed, what's been added, what what uh, what new things are there. But I mean, there haven't been there hasn't been a release lately, so uh, the documentation is actually improved quite a lot. So how do we get it? up and running. Two years ago, this was a massive pain. Um, now, Android Studio for, I think for a year or so, or maybe even more, it would basically just generate uh, your, uh, your test classes, uh, include all the required dependencies for you, so uh, it's, it's really, really smooth and easy to get going. Um, I have some tips in here to how, how to kind of how to include it in a legacy project, but uh, I think we're gonna just skip that because uh, it's really like, in the last two years, the stuff that's been, if you've created an app in the last two years, you probably already used the new, um, it already does that for you. So 
let's skip that and get to the interesting part, which is espresso. Mm, why is it called espresso? Does anyone know? Okay, uh, it's called espresso because it avoids sleep. Um, if you've tested, uh, if you've used like Calabash or Robotium in the past for testing, it's, uh, there are really nice kind of testing frameworks. You, you can like describe everything that, ha that should happen on the screen, assert everything, but uh, it's, the tests tend to be really flaky because it kind of has to, you, you never know when an animation is going to end, even if you disable animations or if it's, God forbid, doing some network uh, work or processing work in the background. So you never know whether something is going to execute in half a second or one second or, so basically what you end up is, uh, with is just a bunch of sleep statements that every time something fails, you'd increase that sleep for, I don't know, another second. So you'd have 30 tests and, uh, out of which there would be sleep statements in there that would wait for like four seconds in each test or maybe two steps per test. It would be like that. So 30 times four times two is a lot. <laughs> so um, if you have the more, the more and more tests you have, it, it gets slower and slower. So that's, that's why it's called espresso. It avoids the sleep. Uh, it's got a really nice API. It's, uh, the syntax is based on Hamcrest. So uh, if, if you've used Hamcrest for Java testing or there is a bunch of libraries out there for pretty much every platform out there, even JavaScript has one. Um, it has this kind of nice looking chaining API. So you, do, you start with something like on view and then you describe the view that you're looking for and then perform, for instance, a click or assertion. So you check that it's displayed. Google has a nice uh, cheat sheet to, uh, on their website that basically, uh, basically kind of explains all the core functionality of Espresso. How it looks like in action, I hope this is visible. Uh, mind you, there will be a few more slides with code, but uh, I'll release those after the, the talk, so you, I'll just talk through them essentially. You don't have to pay attention too much to it. Essentially. You start with an on view and then you specify a view that's identified by this identifier. So with ID, our ID button, perform, click. These are all static, uh, static uh, methods that uh, you just import and it all works like magic. Obviously that's not enough. We can combine them using things like all of, any of, or say a view that has a sibling of this view or a parent of this view, or, and then go towards things like is displayed, is dialogue, uh, and yeah, the same, the same for actions. So you can scroll, you, you, can, you can type text. There's a bunch of stuff you can do. So that was the core Espresso. So this works on any odd Android view, but obviously, there is a bunch of stuff in the other support libraries that we can use now, like recycler view and drawers and things like that. Um, so they've started adding new things in Espresso in the contrib part of the library that contains things like uh, recycler view utils and accessibility utils and date picker utils. So you can actually use Espresso to just kind of say, uh, pick me this date. Uh, so it's a lot nicer. So that's all available for you out of the box. But what's more interesting is uh, how do we extend Espresso's core functionality to, uh, to interact with our custom views, to make our tests even nicer to read, better. So I'm going to be focusing on these things a bit more. So uh, I mean, custom views are quite popular, especially if you kind of reuse the functionality and uh, so you'd have, I don't know, a custom widget that's available on every screen. So for, for that widget, you can just write your own custom matchers and assertions to kind of interact with it. Mm. So yeah, custom matchers allows you to find any odd view in your hierarchy. So how does that work? Uh, you extend an existing matcher. I, 
I suggest like a bounded matcher, which typecasts it to your, to your expected type. And uh, there was just two methods to overwrite. First off, it's describe to, and then it matches safely. So describe to just is just a test description method. So it's going to tell you where it failed, essentially. And uh, matches safely is uh, basically is, 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 a, is a method that returns a Boolean whether a certain view that you pass in matches that, uh, matches that condition. So in this example that may or may not be well visible, I have a view that has a custom property. And uh, my view matcher will basically return true if that view has a custom property. So custom property is just a Boolean. Uh, function that returns a boolean and that will essentially <coughs> be relayed. Um, obviously, you're not going to end up with such trivial examples, but you get the gist. Mm. Next up, we have the view actions. Think of actions as uh, things you can kind of perform on a view or a custom view. So uh, they basically incorporate the matcher and some things you can do on the screen to perform the action that you want to do. So uh, I had to create exactly one in my entire career, which is the uh, scrollable scroll view. What happened was um, um, in Espresso, you have a scroll to method, which, uh, which is only applicable if you, your view that you, you want to scroll in extends the scrollable view. No, extends a scroll view, which is a scroll view or a list view or, 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 a, or a grid view. But uh, it wouldn't work for the new nested scroll views. It wouldn't work for recycler views. So I ended up poking around the code and seeing that recycler view and nested scroll view actually implement a scrollable interface. And my scrollable view didn't do that. So yeah, creating a new action, basically, you, you want to create a static method just because it's much nicer to see it in your, in your uh, tests. So I create a scrollable cl scroll to action and all of that. No, I'm joking. Um, essentially, the, what I did was I took the implementation from the existing scroll to method, which does all the magic drawing things with rectangles and uh, positioning on screen, and just changed the, the get constraints method that would take a scrollable view uh, instance. And that's essentially, that's essentially what I had to do to make, to make this work. And I just copied all of that stuff from the existing implementation. And I think that that's most of the cases is just something that would not be picked up by default and you just kind of move into it. Otherwise, there is some mathematics involved, obviously, if you kind of move, move things around or pan or drag or, or things like that. Mm. So yeah, in my, in my case, that worked. Uh, I was able to scroll in nested, sc nested scroll views, which was nice. Next up, we have the custom idling resources. I touched on that earlier when I was uh, explaining how Espresso, uh, how Espresso avoids sleeps. So the way it does is by using idling resources. By default, it just looks at, uh, I think, a pool of tasks that might be executing, so animation tasks, and, uh, and I think it looks at the async task pool. But if you're Android developers, you know that you should like run away screaming if you see an async task. So, um, so you probably have some other logic going on in there. <clears throat> there is just one thing to like implement, so this uh, idling resource interface, and uh, override the three methods that you have here. So get name is idle now, and register uh, a callback that will get triggered when it's when it's over. You then you then register that uh, idling resources uh, in the instrumentation and. Uh, as long as it's not returning idle, Espresso will wait before executing the next step. It's brilliant. Mm. So yeah, in my example, I had, a, I had a little idling resource that basically waited for an event bus event to get captured. 
So uh, when it was created, it would register event bus, and uh, when, it, when, when the event would be, get event is received, then uh, loading will be completed, and uh, it'll trigger as idle via the callback. Uh, one more thing to note here is the get name function, which has to be unique for the for all the for all the uh, idling resources that you're registering at a given time. So if you only have one of those idling resources registered, then you can just use the class name. If not, you might you you will need to kind of figure out a different naming scheme to kind of detect them. Because uh, basically what it does, it uses a, a string-based map to, uh, to identify all the idling resources that are running. Okay, what we got so far is we have our, a bunch of espresso statements, we have uh, some idling resources, we have custom matchers, custom actions and assertions. But our espresso tests, they don't look nice because even though the API is rather easy to read. If you have like 10 steps in your test, it's going to be a mess. That's why we, utilize, we can utilize something like the page object pattern or pop. I first encountered this in Calabash actually, uh, where uh, the idea is that your kind of assertions and steps are quite complicated. So you kind of extract that logic into, into kind of step methods and just use the method names in your tests. So, uh, and you would present your screens as pages. So an activity or a fragment would be a page. Um, so you basically create your little DSL that kind of allows you to, to uh, have tests nice and readable and maintainable as well because you'll see where, where in, in the test exactly is it failing. Um, you create your page class, so in this case we have your, my uh, main view which has methods to enter username, enter password and press continue and also um, assertions that checks whether an error is shown. So for instance maybe we're checking for a failed login. And in a test that would look like essentially enter username, enter password and pass it, obviously passing in the incorrect password and uh, asserting that the error shown is, is true. And in those implementations, obviously, regular Espresso goes and all is fine. So, Espresso is awesome, but uh, it doesn't allow one thing. It can only test your own app. So, because the way instrumentation works, it kind of in installs a different APK, a test APK that lives in the same process as your app and uh, and uh, it obviously can just interact with the resources in your app. But what if we need to kind of get out to interact with other apps as well? So uh, for that case, we have this utility called UI Automator. It's actually, it's actually one of the earliest things in the, in the, in the Android testing uh, kind of ecosystem because it's been around since forever. Um, but the latest one is actually bundled in the uh, support library. It allows us to interact with any installed application, uh, to go into the system tray, to, to, do, to, per, to perform actions on the actual hardware or whatever the buttons are called nowadays. So you can press home, you can press back, um, you can open the drawer, you can actually uh, do the notifications, you can, you can do stuff like that. So you can actually go into settings and toggle airplane mode and stuff like that. So if you really want like proper end-to-end -end tests, this might be something that you might be interested in. Interested in. It works on the uh, accessibility framework. So use this tool called uh, UI Automator Viewer to kind of analyze a stack, uh, a stack of a view so that you see exactly how, how different components in a cur currently visible components are defined. And then uh, and then you use that in your coding tests. Uh, you get an instance from the instrumentation registry in your tests, and then you just call methods on this UI device. In this example, I was just like pressing the Google search 
uh, pressing the finding and pressing the Google search uh, uh, button on the home home screen. So that's it. Like we can write end-to-end -end tests really easily, but who runs them? It's this guy, Test Runner, or Android JUnit Runner, as it's formally called. What does it do? It's it's what spins up your tests. It's what runs your tests, and uh, you can actually you can actually run individual tests or uh, a batch of tests. Or what we can also do is if, if you're running some kind of fancy mocks in your application, if you have some kind of fancy setup in your application, you can replace that with a mock application that will kind of use mocks instead. Mm. And you can script, you, you can use it to script and run different kind of, not really flavors, but uh, scopes for tests. So you can actually run just the small tests, big tests, so you can kind of pick and choose which kinds of tests you want. And you can shard them as well in parallel. To extend it, uh, for instance, if you want to use a custom application class, provide the, the new dependencies, you can just specify, extend the runner and specify it in your Gradle build file. For instance, uh, Andy Preissler uh, made the Kotlin test runner, which uh, what it does is essentially, if, if you're familiar with Kotlin, every class it generates uh, is marked as final. So that's not really good for testing. So the Kotlin test runner would kind of strip that uh, final um, so that it would, be, it would be easier to kind of replace and test with dependencies. So yeah, you'd extend it and, uh, for instance, return a new application. Uh, that would be my test application instead of my main application. Mm. Running on the command line or not on the command line in a, in a CI context, uh, that's also really cool because, as I mentioned, you can run either just flaky tests or you can, you can just lar run large tests. Uh, depending on how your built pipeline is structured. You can also, I found this really useful for like more longer running tests is to uh, debug tests without having to reinstall the entire application. Before instance run, that used to be a, a pain, but now it's a bit easier. So you can actually, when you run something in Android Studio, if you run like a method, a test method, it will actually uh, print out what it actually ran. So you can actually just copy that, put it in command line, and run the same method. And if your debugger is picked up, you can actually just jump straight into debugging. So it, for some weird kind of flaky tests, it's, it's, it's a totally legit uh, option. The API is uh, not something you'd want to write on a day-to-day -day basis, essentially, because you have to use the uh, ADB shell and then the AM command. But yeah, you can essentially specify uh, class name, method name, package name, and uh, obviously the runner. Mm. The documentation have this uh, testing in other IDEs kind of uh, section that explains that. Last but not least, the uh, support library contains uh, different rules. So I mentioned activity uh, test rule that replaced activity instrumentation test case two. Um, there is also a service test rule and you can actually ex extend it and add more rules. So far, I've never had to use something like that, but I've seen one done in, uh, by uh, Artem Zinatulin, the mock web server rule in his uh, Quality Matters uh, repository, which is excellent. Um, what he did was he would, if, if he needed to mock any web responses, he would basically uh, tell the mock web server, create a mock web server rule with a response that the mock web server would return so that he would essentially mock everything, well, use everything apart for the network layer. I personally mock the network one step lower, so uh, I can just use, uh, mock the retro retrofit responses or whatever, but this is something that you can also utilize. But it's got quite a lot of moving parts, so it's, it's too much to be showing here. And uh, that's everything for the testing support library, but there is more from the mothership where uh, 
um, where it comes from. So essentially Firebase, you probably are all familiar with it. I hope, I, I think that at least some of you have used it, if not everyone. Firebase has uh, this thing called the test lab for Android, which allows you to run your espresso tests, uh, instrumentation tests on Google's infrastructure. It's by far not the only uh, such offering, like Xamarin had their test cloud for, for, since forever, and uh, there is a bunch of others that allow you to do similar things. But Firebase, for, in my opinion, is really interesting because um, it has a free tier. Uh, I think it's like 100 minutes a month or something like that. That's free, but still, for small apps, it's completely legit. It also supports running on VMs so that maybe if you're a startup or something, you have very constrained resources. It's very cheap to actually run your tests on the VMs and you don't have to have a dedicated kind of uh, Jenkins box with uh, the emulator plug plugged into it or God forbid you don't have to use Travis to spin up the very, very, very slow emulator that they have. Mm. I know there is other options out there now, like it used to be called Greenhouse, I think they're renamed since. Anyway, um, there is another component to the Firebase test, which is the Robo test. It's part of the Play Store, and uh, what it does is it will essentially just run kind of run automated tests without your intervention on uh, the apps. It could even, if you provide it with a credential, like a Google account, it would even log in if you have a Google, uh, login with Google button in there. So that's, that's actually really interesting because it will just randomly run it and uh, if you detect any crashes in stuff that you've submitted to the Play Store, it will obviously tell you. That's also like free to use and uh, could be beneficial to someone. Lastly, we have uh, the Espresso Test Recorder. It's been with us since uh, a few versions ago. So uh, what it does is it kind of allows you to record testing steps. So you would start and uh, you would start and uh, write your tests by clicking on the screen and entering fields and uh, entering uh, strings into the entry fields and it would essentially generate you some very ugly code. But that ugly code is being auto-generated so you can actually get, get a few free, almost free tests, uh, espresso tests out of it. So, uh, I mean, they're ugly, but it's nothing that a few Android Studio refactorings couldn't fix. Um, yeah, it's built into Android Studio, so just like press record and yeah, you'd end up with this pop-up and it just does it for you. It's quite cool. There's a few other bits and pieces in there, uh, like you can test web views. I haven't had to do that, luckily, but uh, yeah, there is quite a lot of web view support apparently. Uh, that I don't know how well it works. Uh, it hasn't been like it hasn't been updated much since. I hope for something to come out out of the next month's uh, Google I/O. Uh, but uh, stuff was being added up until last year. It was uh, quite cool. And yeah, obviously, my favorite thing about the library is. Uh, it's open source, so you're free to just kind of poke around it and uh, try to improve it, maybe do a PR to the contrib library, and uh, it's all really cool. Um, yeah, that's all from me. I mean, if you've enjoyed the testing talk, if you're interested in that, Xavier has one on Thursday, I think. Should be very interesting as well. And uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, if you're iOS developers, uh, Google actually made something called Earl Grey, which is similar to Espresso, but for iOS, so kind of avoids the sleeps, so maybe it's worth checking that out as well. Um, 
And yeah, you can reach me on Twitter and email zan at markin.me or zan at pusher.com. Um, I'm also quite active on a Slack team called Android Chat and uh, sometimes I blog something on space, spacecowboyrocketcompany.com. So that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, there is one. Can we change the lights a little bit? Because I, I can hardly see anything from here. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was just wondering, you were talking about uh, DUI Automator there and the possibility of testing notifications. Does, is there like an idling resource thing for that? Or do you have to wait? Or what is the situation with the DNO? I honestly do not know, I but uh, I know you can do it. <laughs> okay. I've seen it. I've seen some some repos that kind of showed the example for it. But if I can find it, then I'll let you know. But I'm not sure off the top of my head. No worries. Thank you. Any more? That's it. Then I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Cheers.